Welcome back everybody to a special reaction video. So um, for anyone that's new to the channel, on Mondays I tend to put out, uh, when you know there's something available, I'll put out a special reaction video, something that doesn't always fit into the regular schedule. There's regular reaction content every Wednesday and Friday. Um, but things that are ongoing series, um, you know, the videos that keep coming out on a schedule that I can't align my schedule with, I'll put them out on a Monday. So, um, currently that's pretty much the Kings and Generals Ukraine videos. So we're returning to that today. Now this is a short uh, video for their standards. This is only 14 minutes long. So this will probably just be the sing uh, a single part video. Um, it's, you know, about half as long as their normal content on Ukraine is. Their normal content tends to be about half an hour or so. Um, but it still should be an interesting look because this is how Ukraine changed the power balance in the Black Sea, which should be interesting because it'd be interesting to know if that's not just relating to the military uh, situation, but also the political situation as well. Um, so this should be uh, interesting to look at. As always, because this is a Ukraine video, there will be links in the description to donate to charities and also to Ukraine directly, um, of charities that are also helping out in uh, Ukraine, but also there's links to donate to Ukraine directly so they can purchase things like supplies um, and weapons. So please look into that too. Um, as always, please leave a like and some comments for the algorithm gods. Make sure you subscribe to the notifications are on. There's also a link to my Patreon in the description, so check that out too um, if you get a moment. But let's just dive straight in. So this is how Ukraine changed the power balance in the Black Sea by kings and generals. Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, 2022, much of the fighting has been conducted on land and in the air, but in many ways the Black Sea is one of the core reasons for the war itself. While there has been little ship-to-ship -ship fighting, the Russian Black Sea fleet was tasked with a critical role in the Russian offensive, while the Ukrainian navy, small by comparison, until recently has struggled to challenge its neighbour directly. In this video, we will talk about the overall situation in the Black Sea and how the ongoing war possibly changed the balance of power for decades to come. Today we can also help you get a grip on geopolitics, or specifically the geo part, with a brilliant look at the board on which the game takes place. It's Earth, miniaturized and put on display in your home by our sponsors, Mova Globes. These globes rotate seemingly of their own accord, with no power source. That's because they absorb solar energy from the room's ambient light to power a magnetic rotation system hidden inside, meaning you get a dynamic rotating globe with no fuss whatsoever. If it seems a little too good, that's just because it's newly developed technology with an ultra-low friction motor and something called microvolume fluid levitation. Basically, MOVA globes just work on their own and look good doing it. As you've probably noticed, it doesn't actually need to be a globe of Earth. They have plenty of other planets to choose from, and even a few things that aren't planets, with over 40 designs in all. Whatever you choose, MOVA globes make for a great decoration and a cool gift for the person who has everything. Get 10% off a 6 or 8.5 inch MOVA globe by using our code KINGSANDGENERALS at movaglobes.com. The Russian Black Sea Fleet is based in the Crimean port city of Sevastopol and has responsibility for the Black Sea, the Sea of Azov and the Mediterranean Sea, although access to the Mediterranean from the Black Sea for any Russian naval ships is currently prohibited by the terms of the 1936 Montreux Convention, which Turkey is currently enforcing. We will note that passage of Russian warships which are already part of the Black Sea Fleet from the Mediterranean to the Black Sea is permitted as they are considered to be returning to their home port. This condition prevents ships from being transferred from other Russian fleets to augment naval strength in the Black Sea region. The Black Sea Fleet's offensive power, since the sinking of the cruiser Moskva by the Ukrainians on the 14th of April 2022, is centered on five guided missile frigates, two of them Soviet-era Krivak-class ships, commissioned in the 1980s, and three Krivak-5 class ships, each commissioned in the last 10 years. These newer frigates are built around their ability to carry and launch Caliber and Onyx cruise missiles. Since the loss of the Moskva, 
The Fregat M2M air search radars have also been used to track and monitor air traffic in the combat areas in the south of Ukraine. The other offensive arm of the fleet is the three improved Kilo class and one Kilo class diesel attack submarines currently active with the fleet. There are seven Kilo or improved Kilo class boats registered to the Black Sea fleet, but two are in a maintenance cycle, while one is currently deployed in the Mediterranean, basing itself from Tarsus in Syria. These submarines are equipped with caliber and onyx cruise missiles and represent a strategic deterrence in the region. The Black Sea Fleet also supports a series of Alligator and Rapucha 1 and 2 class assault ships, designed for conducting large-scale amphibious landings. Attacks by Ukrainian forces in February and May of 2022 report having disabled two of these ships, however Russia continues to list them as available for action. The six assault ships registered to the Black Sea Fleet have been augmented by five assault ships from the Baltic Fleet and one from the Northern Fleet all of which passed through the Dardanelles before they were closed by Turkey. These major warships are augmented by a series of missile corvettes from the Degach and Buyan M-Class, equipped with caliber cruise missiles, but designed for littoral combat, providing close-in support during landing operations. Among Just for anyone that's not aware, um, littoral combat generally refers to close to the shore, so the littorals, essentially, um, as opposed to ships that are more specifically built for combat in deep water, you know, out in the ocean. Littoral is generally very close close to shore, um, either to, you know, stuff like that would be good for dissuading piracy operations, that kind of thing, but also for coast guards, you know, uh, ships that they would use, um, and also for supporting amphibious landings as well. Among the various support vessels deployed by the Black Sea Fleet is the Ivan Kurs, a new Yuri Ivanov class SIGINT collections vessel designed for intelligence gathering, surveillance, communications, electronic warfare, and fleet management. The Ukrainian Navy is, by comparison, very small, consisting largely of patrol craft mostly laid down during the Soviet era. Few of these ships have any ship-to-ship -ship missile capability, and rely on autocannons, close-in weapon systems, and mounted machine guns for both defense and offensive capability. The Ukrainian Navy is augmented by ships of the Ukrainian Sea Guard and the Border Patrol Service, and include a Pauk class ASW corvette, as well as a mixture of Stenker and Schemmel fast attack ships, all originally built in the Soviet era. The United States has promised accelerated delivery of new ships for both the Navy and the Sea Guard, but these are all expected to be smaller patrol boats, suitable for littoral and riverine hit and run engagements. NATO present. And I think that would probably suit Ukraine's strategy right now, because Ukraine Ukraine's strategy is predominantly focused around um, the land war, you know, achieving land and air superiority. And you don't necessarily need a navy to win the war in this area, because, um, as I said, the Ukrainian forces have advanced, in the south at least anyway, towards like the Black Sea area. They've advanced to the, to the um, bank of the river here. So they've got the the Russians in the in the you know deep southern regions of Ukraine. So um, and if the land forces are defeated and Ukraine manages to retake Crimea uh, by land, then the naval forces don't really pose too much of a threat in that sense because if you can control this entire area, you know you can then station anti ship missile batteries all sorts of defences along this area, which would make any approach by the Russians very hazardous um, for any kind of counter-attack. So um, I don't really see the, the you know, th there's no real necessity, I think, to deliver more powerful ships to Ukraine. You know, there's no need to give them things like destroyers or cruisers or anything like that, um, because I just don't see, like, the naval component being particularly decisive either way. Um, where the threat is with the naval component is an amphibious assault. Now, they were, they were thinking that there might be an amphibious assault against Odessa, which is Ukraine's largest city that's still under Ukrainian control in the south that borders the Black Sea. Um, but it's likely that things like the sinking of the Moskva, bearing in mind the Moskva was the most powerful ship in the Black Sea fleet, um, actions like that have massively... Dis and, and as well, you know, just 
Russian capability in general, but particularly the sinking of the Moskva, it's likely that that would have dissuaded any attempts at a, an amphibious landing, because if those ships come within range of missile batteries on shore, then that could prove to be a very serious risk, particularly if they're not disabled. Um, you know, that's a huge risk with any amphibious landing. You look at some, even, you know, as going as far back as things like World War II, you look at, you know, something like the, um, you know, the Normandy landings, for example, you know, um, it was very risky for those ships to get close into the shore to provide fire support because, you know, though in theory, there were supposed to have been huge bombings by the RAF and the US Army Air Force um, against German positions. But because of things like bad weather and, you know, and whatnot, most of the bombs had, you know, missed their targets. So a lot of German defenses were still intact and pretty strong. Um, so to get those ships in close was pretty risky. Um, and it always has been, particularly now that we have very advanced weapons like guided missiles and things like that. You know, you don't even really need to see the ships to be able to destroy them. So um, that's going to be a serious risk either way. So like I say, I, I don't see necessarily the need for things like um, large warships. I think it would be better to give them small and more nimble ships, um, perhaps ships that do have missile capacity, anti-ship missile capacity, um, but also a lot of naval drones, um, particularly submersible naval drones, because, um, you know, those are pretty, those have proven to be pretty useful uh, in the war so far. Since in the Black Sea is mainly composed of ships from three countries, Romania, Bulgaria and Turkey. The Turkish Navy comprises the largest NATO force in the region, composed of a mix of 12 diesel-electric Type 209 boats of German design, meant for anti-ship warfare, 16 frigates, including 8 Gabia-class ships, which are modernized Oliver Hazard Perry-class frigates, originally built for the US Navy, and designed for both anti-ship and anti-submarine warfare, armed with both Sea Sparrow and Harpoon missiles, as well as Mark 46 or Mark 50 ASW torpedoes. The Harpoon missiles are in the process of being replaced by Turkish-designed Atmaja sea-skimming anti-ship missiles, which have a range of at least 250 kilometers. Turkey can also contribute up to nine corvettes for NATO duty, designed for both ASW and littoral combat. The Turkish Navy includes over 30 amphibious warfare ships, including two Bayraktar LSTs, giving Turkey the ability to move and land troops and armor within the region. Romania is able to augment this force with several frigates and corvettes, designed around ASW combat, but with full ship-to-ship -ship combat capability. Bulgaria similarly offers the same type of force disposition of older but refurbished Belgian frigates and Soviet-era corvettes. Both the Romanian Navy and the Bulgarian Navy offer a number of minesweeping ships, deemed of crucial importance in the Black Sea theater of operations, in light of both the Russian and Ukrainian Navy's propensity to use sea mines in the area. Crucially, the ships of the Turkish Navy are free to move through the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus at will. While many ships of the Turkish fleet are based from ports in the Mediterranean Sea, they have the ability to be redeployed into the Black Sea as necessary. Both the Romanian and Bulgarian navies are based in the Black Sea itself, making them a permanent force in the theater. No other NATO naval ships are able to enter the Black Sea at this time, largely fixing the naval strengths in the region. Some of the earliest Ukrainian naval losses in the war occurred in the opening weeks of the Russian invasion. During the Battle of Berdyansk, Russian forces captured several Ukrainian ships, including a Matka-class missile boat and several Gyuza M-class artillery boats. There is still some dispute over whether these ships have been captured or sunk. In addition, the flagship of the Ukrainian Navy, the Krivak 3-class frigate Hetman Sahedachny, itself due to begin an extensive refit, was scuttled while still in port in Mykolaiv. This was done to prevent the ship from being captured by the Russians. The early months of the war saw the most naval action, with the Black Sea Fleet dominating proceedings. This included the bombardment and capture of Snake Island, a key outpost near the Romanian border, from which control of ships entering and leaving the vital Ukrainian port of Odessa could be exerted. Amphibious landings against the port were anticipated but never materialized, likely due to increased pressure on Russian forces in other areas of the war. On April 13th, 
And that's kind of what I was getting at with the Russian capability uh, front, because Russian forces were too heavily engaged on other fronts anyway to peel off enough forces to support an amphibious landing. An amphibious landing takes a lot of resources, and there's a lot that can go wrong with them. You know, they're extremely risky. Um, you look at things, you know, go back to the Normandy invasion. It's the most famous example of an amphibious assault. Um, you look at that, and, you know, it's when you look at it in detail, it's nothing short of a minor miracle that the Allies actually won, um, because it was very, very nearly a complete disaster. Um, you know, you look at things like um, how scattered the airborne forces were, the fact that um, despite the fact that the Allies held all five beaches on the first day, um, they had actually achieved none of their main objectives, which was to link them. You know, most of them weren't linked until a week later. I think only two of them, I think it was Juno and Gold, uh, beaches, or maybe Juno and Sword, um, those were the only beaches that were linked on the first day. Most of them weren't linked until a week later, you know, so the Allies were in a very precarious position for most of that, um, most of that time, and it just shows how even with all that overwhelming support that the Allies had, you know, they had extreme air superiority at that time, they had absolute naval supremacy, um, you know, they could field hundreds of thousands to millions of troops to support this invasion and even then it was still very very risky you, you know it was still almost a complete catastrophe um so even an assault on odessa even if the russians could land there there's no guarantee that they wouldn't then be driven back into the sea so land-based ukrainian forces mounted an attack on the slava class cruiser moskva whose long-range radar and air defense system was providing protection for Russian ships operating off the Ukrainian coast. The successful attack, which is believed to have been made by using aerial drones as a distraction, struck the Moskva with two R-360 Neptune cruise missiles. These missile strikes appear to have ignited onboard munitions, causing an explosion which overturned the vessel, sinking it. There has been little offensive use of Russia's Black Sea Fleet since the sinking of the cruiser Moskva on April 14th. The threat posed by the Ukrainian Neptune anti-ship missiles, as well as Western-supplied Harpoon anti-ship missiles, has forced the fleet to largely remain at anchor inside Sevastopol, or to operate well offshore, or even behind the Crimean Peninsula, where their effectiveness and ability to support operations on land are greatly diminished. And that's what I mean by even if um, Ukraine retake the Crimea by land, you know, even though it's still a mu you know it's a much larger coastline to defend against a naval force. The submarine oh, didn't mean to hit play then again there. Just go back a little bit. But even if they manage to retake the Crimea, it's a much larger coastline to protect. But you know, just that one sinking of the Moskva shows that you know even just that one attack can dissuade further naval operations, um, because. You know, um, especially because the fact it was the most prestigious ship in that fleet. Um, but it makes, you know, it would make you wary of getting your ships too close to shore again. You know, and it just shows that even a small success in the grand scale of things, you know, the sinking of the Moskva didn't change the, the naval balance of power necessarily because the Russians still have a very large fleet there. Um, but if you can make the enemy basically not use it out of fear of losing more ships... Um, that's where the real victory comes. Um, so even if the Ukrainians retake the entire Crimea, I still don't see the Black Sea Fleet being that much of a threat for that reason, because then you've got more positions to, you know, it, Ukraine would then have a larger coastline to defend, you know, that's one concern, but also you've got more places from which to launch missiles from. You know, you've increased your range out into this area, whereas at the minute it's basically confined to this bit of the coast here. Whereas if you can increase the range, it would then force the Black Sea Fleet to retreat somewhere else. So um, that's what I'm getting at when I say I don't really see it being much of a threat anyway. Land are greatly diminished. The submarine force, which should be able to fulfill its mission as a cruise missile platform, has been more muted than expected being involved in some missile strike operations, but as the force least at risk from Ukrainian retaliation, performance has been quite subdued. While active sea... That's interesting as well, because, like I say, there's, there's very little risk to the submarines, necessarily, because, for one thing, they're difficult to detect compared to a ship. 
in, you know, a ship you can get visual contact for one thing. A submarine, very, very difficult to get visual contact with. So, for obvious reasons. So, it's unusual that they've not been supporting operations more, particularly, you know, the Kherson front. So, that would probably lead me to believe that either you know, one or all of these is true, or a combination thereof, which is that perhaps morale is low in the fleet, um, or perhaps those boats aren't particularly well-maintained, so they can't sustain long operations, or perhaps that um, the resources for them to conduct the missions aren't there, um, because they've been diverted elsewhere. So, um, that's interesting, though, that they have basically just been sat in port doing next to nothing. Born threats seem to be quite minimal in the region. There have been, and continue to be, concerns over more passive threats spilling over from the war, specifically that posed by drifting naval mines. Both Russian and Ukrainian forces have deployed naval mines to deny access to regions of water. This includes the deployment of mines by the Russians to aid in enforcing the attempted blockade of Odessa while the Ukrainians have deployed their own mines in the same region to help in anti-invasion proceedings. Some of these mines have broken free and are drifting on open currents, posing a threat to shipping in the Black Sea, with the threat being taken seriously even through the Bosphorus and Dardanelles. NATO minesweepers are on alert as a result, looking to find and deactivate any potential threats, and have been called into action multiple times in the western area of the Black Sea. With the loss of the air protection supplied by Moskva, Russian control over Snake Island, crucial to maintaining any type of blockade of Odessa, became more and more tenuous, including drone and precision missile strikes on Russian resupply craft trying to reinforce the garrison there. On June 30th, Ukraine announced it had regained control of the island, while the Russians claimed their withdrawal as a gesture of goodwill. This withdrawal had the effect of greatly diminishing the ability of the Russian fleet to blockade Ukrainian shipping. Since August 1st, a United Nations brokered deal has been in place, allowing Ukrainian export of grain from the ports of Odessa, Chornomorsk, and Yushny Pivdeny. Ships transporting grain are able to navigate an established corridor and must then stop in Istanbul for inspection by monitors from Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, and the United Nations in order to ensure they are not transporting additional items. As part of this deal, the Ukrainians have agreed not to use the established corridor in the Black Sea to stage attacks against Russian ships and targets. October 29th saw what may possibly be eventually seen as a game-changing moment in naval operations. Ukrainian forces deployed seven uncrewed surface vessels, or USVs, towards the protected Crimean port of Sevastopol. The seven naval drones, approximately the size of a small canoe, penetrated the harbour and caused damage to a frigate and a minesweeper. While the damage was minimal, the impact of this attack forced the Russians to add extra layers of security to the ships and the port, and effectively lock the entire Black Sea fleet away, rendering it useless. Overall, the naval situation in the Black Sea… And that's what I was referring to earlier with the use of naval drones. Um... It's interesting as well because it's almost like the modern equivalent of a fire ship. You know, uh, for anyone who's not familiar, uh, fire ships were used prominently during the Age of Sail, uh, particularly against a stationary fleet, you know, a fleet that you've blockaded or a fleet that was in harbour that you needed to still destroy. Um, or even against a blockading fleet as well, if you wanted to break the blockade. Um, you know, you would send a ship that was essentially, a sac or, or ships, you know, that were essentially sacrificial lands and they were sometimes packed with explosives, um, sometimes not, m more often not, because, you know, they were, it was very risky to do that, but um, you would just say, you know, you would crew them with a minimal crew, a skeleton crew, and you would sail them at the enemy, and then at a specific point, you'd um, ignite them. So you'd just basically turn the ship into a sailing inferno, and then you'd get off the ship, you know, you'd abandon the ship and row away in boats, um, and the ship, you know, carried by the wind, would just sail directly into the enemy. And the idea was to either break up the blockade so you could get your ships out or in, um, or you could, um, if your timing was right, you know, your ships could crash into the enemy ships and set them on fire as well. And because those ships were carrying gunpowder, um, 
large stocks of gunpowder, there's a risk that they could explode. Um, you know, fire ships were very famously used during the siege of Antwerp. I think it was Antwerp. Um, they were called hell burners, which they used there. Um, but also a very famous use was the Battle of Graveline, which um, defeated the Spanish Armada. The English and Dutch used fire ships there. So um, kind of a modern equivalent in a way. Um, and it's not too dissimilar from things like midget submarines that were used in the Second World War that were used to penetrate harbours um, and attack ships. So, um, but it's interesting, like I say, that things, you know, simple things like that can completely change the doctrine that the enemy uses. You know, you sink one ship and then that sent operations then become limited um, because the risk is just too great until you've established some kind of supremacy. You know, because Russia still doesn't have air supremacy um, by any stretch of the imagination. If they had air supremacy, then they could potentially locate and destroy these batteries, which would then give the ships a clear line of sight to the shore. But because they can't do that, the risk is too, too great to, to use them. Um, and we've got, you know, a similar risk here as well that, you know, these drones and, you know, drones have, um, I believe they have a small sonar profile, so they're difficult to kind of, you know, necessarily, um, not, ne not to, not necessarily difficult to detect, but difficult to discern what they actually are. Um, and they're essentially just like smart torpedoes really, um, in that sense. So, um... You know, just a simple attack like that completely changes naval doctrine, you know, and now Russia has essentially locked away its own fleet. So it, it just shows that um, in a more modern conflict, you know, you don't even necessarily need to have these big fleet on fleet engagements like we saw in World War Two, for example, to establish any form of naval supremacy. Um, Ukraine, you know, Ukraine doesn't strictly have naval supremacy because, you know, the, the Black Sea Fleet still is a threat and Ukraine doesn't have that naval capacity of its own. Um, but it's neutralized the Russian Navy as a threat. Um, and all without seeking a decisive engagement. So it just shows how that kind of asymmetrical warfare can, can really work. Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022 has been surprising. While it was expected that the Russian Black Sea Fleet would dominate the Ukrainian Navy, which it rapidly did, the effective and innovative use of the weapons at hand by the Ukrainians has subsequently left the Russian Navy in Crimea a useless liability. We don't expect an active shooting war between the NATO countries and Russia in the Black Sea, but it is clear that the Ukrainians damaged the Russian Black Sea Fleet to an extent that it can't impose its will anymore. Even the NATO fleets that are right now in the Black Sea are sufficient to keep the Russians at bay, so the expectation is that the grain deal will be continued no matter what happens. The continuation of the conflict in this configuration will continue to degrade the Russian naval capabilities in the region and only strengthen the positions of the NATO countries. More videos on the unprovoked and... Yeah, that's true as well, um, because I was going to make the point earlier, which was that even without the rest of NATO naval forces, even without the powerful navies of countries like Britain, uh, America, uh, Canada, France, um, Spain and Italy as well, you know, you've still got enough strength between the NATO members that are already there to m more than adequately, I would say, challenge the Black Sea Fleet if it came to a more traditional naval engagement, you know, um, which would be kind of ironic for anyone that's familiar with history, uh, particularly the Crimean War, because um, it's interesting that we're, we've got a similar region being contested, you know, the same region being contested now. Um, one of the major naval battles of the Crimean War was the Russian Navy's uh, dramatic victory over the, Turk the Ottoman Turkish Navy at the Battle of Sinop, when you had a more modern Russian fleet take on and destroy the Turkish Navy and it had naval supremacy until Britain and France came in. So um, so it's still the same <laughs> region that's been contested, but the um, tables have turned in that way. So it's just one of those like little fascinating historical ironies um, that usually pop up. But um, anyway, I think we're at the end, but we'll just continue briefly. And illegal war Putin's Russia wages on Ukraine are on the way. So make sure to subscribe and press the bell button to see. 
yeah, so we're at the end there. So that was a good little video, and I'm glad it, it did go into the broader political aspect as well, because you've got things like the Green Deal in there. You've also got um, something I hadn't considered, which was the sea mines. You know, that's interesting, actually, that um, they've actually broken away and they're being carried by currents. You know, you'd think there'd be some kind of fail-safe with those mines, that if they do break off those chains, that they just detonate, you know, automatically. Um, or that they can be maybe remote detonated. But I know sea mines are pretty simple uh, designs. Um, but, you know, either way, it's something to consider, I suppose. But um, I'm glad it got the wider political context in there as well about the, um, the NATO countries, and particularly the Turkish Navy, because the Turkish Navy is the single greatest threat in the area to the Russian Navy. So I'm glad they took all that into context as well. But uh, another good video. So um, there'll be a link to the original video and the Kings and Generals channel as well in the description. So go show them some support. And as always, thank you all so much for watching. We'll be back on Wednesday with our continuing look at the Decemberist revolt. So please make sure that you're subscribed for that. In the meantime, thank you all so much for watching and I shall see you all on the next one.